Will you please turn to the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of Luke chapter 22, Luke chapter 22. Now if you are uh, new with us this morning, uh, we welcome you. Uh, my name is Jason, I'm one of the pastors on staff, and so I'd love to meet you after the service if we had not met before. All right, so if you'll find Luke chapter 22 and mark that, we will begin there shortly. But as you're turning there, I want to ask you this question. Okay, here's the question. How do you learn best? All right? What's your preferred learning style? Now, maybe you've never thought about this before, so let me kind of help you out a little bit and and go through some of the different learning styles that there are. So number one, we have good old reading and writing learners, so we're all familiar with this from school. Uh, Some of us like this one better than others. Some of us are really adept at this type of learning. If you read things, if you write things down, this is really a, a helpful way for you to absorb information. And number two, we have auditory learners. This is you. You like to to learn by listening, by hearing. This is how you absorb information. Number three, we have visual learners. So if you like maps and and charts and images, uh, this may be your preferred learning style. You prefer this over reading and, and things like that. And number four, we have kinesthetic learners. So if sitting in a classroom just drives you nuts, you get so fidgety, you just can't stand still, this might be indicating this is your type of learning style. Maybe you like to to kind of hold a ball, or my my kids have this fidget spinner that they spin as they're hearing things. This type of learner really likes to get their hands dirty. All right, so where do you land? How do you learn best? I've been thinking about this this week, really the last couple weeks, And here's my conclusion. I think we all have preferred learning styles, whether it's listening or reading and writing, but I think we all use all four types of styles. So for example, let's take maybe the topic of parenting, all right? So you can read about parenting, you can listen, talks about parenting, you can see others parent their children, but you really need that hands-on experience, right? Lots of ideas until you actually parent. Or maybe you take leadership. Again, you can read about leadership. You can see others do it, and that's all helpful. But again, you have to experience it. You need to do that kinesthetic type of learning. And the reason I bring this up and I ask you, how do you learn best, is because our Creator God, our God who knows us so well, loves us so much, He has given us different ways to learn about who He is, to learn about the gospel and His plan of salvation. And so we think about God's Word, the Bible, and how we learn by reading it. We also learn from gifted teachers, right, and preachers. They explain God's Word, and they build us up in the faith by hearing. But God has also provided a way for us to learn visually, and that hands-on, that kind of experiential way through baptism and the Lord's Supper. And so this past month, uh, we've had just a number of baptisms in our church. It's been just great to see, awesome to see. Now, if you've gone through the waters of baptism recently, or maybe I want you to remember back to your own baptism, this is a very experiential way to grow in your faith. So think back to your own baptism. You're standing or maybe sitting in the water, and then you go down into the water and it washes over you. And then you come back up and it's just dripping off of you, and you know something has taken place. You feel that your sins have been cleansed that you have a a renewed relationship with your Creator. Yes, we know that Christ is the one that actually provides our salvation. In Christ, through His blood, He is the one that cleansed us from sin. But yet, there's something that we've experienced, something that we've felt. But not only do we feel this and experience this in baptism, we also see a visual picture in baptism of the gospel. The gospel means the good news, the good news about who Jesus Christ is. And so when we watch a baptism and that person goes down into the water, we get this picture of their sins being washed away. But also we see this, our union with Christ, that Christ was buried and then he rose from the dead. And that's the picture of baptism, that we're buried to that old life and raised to walk in new life found in Jesus Christ. But we also get to experience and learn the gospel through the Lord's Supper, through communion, where we hold and we taste the bread and the cup. And so with both baptism and the Lord's Supper, we experience them. 
but we also visually get to see this picture of the gospel. And through this, we learn and we, we grow in our faith in this experiential way. And baptism and Lord's Supper, they were both instituted by Christ before he ascended to heaven. And so when it comes to baptism, we're reminded of what's called the Great Commission. And the Great Commission is found in each of the Gospels, but most probably clearly, the one that we're the most familiar with is found in Matthew chapter 28. And Jesus, he says this about baptism. He says, all authority has been given to me. And then he says to his disciples, and by extension us today, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. But also before Jesus ascended to heaven, on the night that he was betrayed, the night that he went through this trial, that would ultimately lead to his death on the cross. Before any of that took place, we find Jesus and his disciples sharing this Passover meal. But as we'll see in our passage, Jesus takes this Passover meal and he remakes it into something new. And it's pointing to himself. And so in our time together, we're going to look at the preparation of the Passover found in verses 7 to 13. And then in verses 14 to 20 of chapter 22, we see how Jesus takes this Passover meal and changes it, remakes it into something new. All right, if you have verse 7 of Luke chapter 22, we see the preparation of the Passover. Look with me at verse 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John saying, Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare for it, they asked. He replied, as you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Now, let's pause there. This is kind of an odd comment. Okay, you see this guy carrying a jar of water. Why would this be unique? Well, in this cultural setting, uh, Jewish men did not carry water. I don't know all the reasons why, but it, when they saw this, it would have caught their eye. All right, let's, let's keep going. Follow him to the house that he enters. And say to the owner of the house, the teacher ask, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Verse 12, he will show you a large room upstairs, all furnished. Make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. So let's get a little bit of the context of what is taking place this week. So Jesus, he enters the city of Jerusalem, what we know as the triumphal entry. Okay, we call it now Palm Sunday, which what we're celebrating today. And Jesus, as he enters the city, the people are hailing him as the Messiah, as the king. And they're laying their cloaks on the ground. They're waving palm branches because they have been expecting and, and wanting this Messiah for thousands of years. And now here he is, Jesus the king. But then as the week proceeds, in the first part of this week, Jesus is teaching. But he's also in this confrontation with the rulers of Jerusalem. And the rulers of Jerusalem, they hate Jesus. They're seeking a way to arrest him and to have him killed. And so the tensions during this week are extremely high. And so Jesus, he enters on Sunday, but by Friday, and this is the dramatic shift, he is crucified. But on Thursday, he prepares for this meal, this meal that he has longed to have with his disciples. And let me add this week, this holy week leading up to Easter next Sunday, I would encourage you to be in the Gospels reading, to be praying, to be reflecting, getting your heart ready for Easter. But I would also encourage you, just that, that community part of our church, to come on Thursday night. We are having our Monday service. It's a very unique service. It's very intimate. It's different, really, than anything we do uh, the rest of the year. When we reflect on Scripture. We pray. It's amazing to look back to last year and some of the prayers that were being asked and how the Lord has answered them this past year. So, again, I encourage you to be there. Now, as we're reading this section of our passage, we almost get this sense of secrecy from Jesus. Jesus had his 12 disciples, but he only sends two of them, uh, John and Peter, to get this meal ready. So why this secrecy? It's because Jesus knows that one of his disciples, a man named Judas, is seeking a way to betray him. 
See, when Jesus was out in public, he would not be arrested because the rulers were afraid of the people. Jesus amazed the people with his, his healing and with his teaching. And these rulers knew if they arrested Jesus, a riot would break out and they would face physical harm. So Jesus, Judas, he, he's, he knows this. He, so he's trying to find this time when, when Jesus would be alone. But Jesus, he, he understands what's happening. And so he sends only Peter and John to prepare this meal. But let me say this, though we may kind of sense this secrecy in this first part of our passage, this secrecy is not because Christ was worried. No, Jesus knew what would take place. So he is making the necessary arrangements to have this meal with his disciples, to talk to them, to prepare them for his departure. And so Jesus knew that Judas would betray him. Jesus knew he would be arrested, put through a mock trial, be killed on the cross, but none of this took place without him knowing and willingly letting it happen. Jesus willingly was arrested. One of the amazing things as you're reading the Gospel of John, and you may do that this week, is that when Jesus, they were seeking to arrest him, and Judas, he gives them that, that kiss of betrayal. And they say to Jesus, all these to arrest him, are you the Messiah? Are you the one? And Jesus says, I am, and it knocks everybody down. And that is the power that Christ had. He did not have to do this, but he willingly was arrested and he willingly went to the cross for us. Now, if you are new to the Bible, why this Passover? What is this meal all about? And this Passover meal was a, a meal the Jewish people still celebrate today. And they celebrate it every year in remembrance of God's deliverance of them from slavery in Egypt. See, in the second book of the Bible, in the book of Exodus, we find God's chosen people, the Israelites, and they've been in slavery for over 400 years by Pharaoh and the Egyptians. And it was harsh and, and miserable. And the Israelites, they had cried out to God. They'd been praying to God, please deliver us. And so the Lord begins to work on their behalf. And he sends these 10, 10 plagues. Now these plagues, they're, they're kind of crazy, really a little bit disgusting. There's frogs and there's flies and there's locusts. And you may hear all this about the frogs and the flies and think, why would God use these type of plagues? And the reason is because these plagues were a direct assault on all the false gods of Egypt. See, in Egypt, their gods were connected to nature. And so this is why the Lord is doing this. But what the Lord also wants the Egyptians and both the Israelites to see is that the Lord, Yahweh, he alone is the true and living God. But even though God had sent these nine awful plagues, the Pharaoh of Egypt was defiant. He would not let the people go. He chose them to keep them in slavery until this 10th plague, which involved the death of the firstborn son. But why did this 10th plague involve the death of the firstborn son? There is a work by a Jewish scholar. His name is John Levinson. And this work is called The Death and Resurrection of of the beloved son. And in this work, we gain a better understanding of ancient cultures. See, in our Western culture, we're much more individualistic. And so this can sound strange how this firstborn is really guilty for the family. And so we might even say it's wrong for one family member to have to pay the debt or the guilt of another family member. But ancient cultures were much more collective. They were not as individualistic. But we also need to understand the importance of the firstborn son in this ancient culture. Because in this ancient culture, families put all their hope for the future in the firstborn son. And so the firstborn son held a special status. They would receive the majority, if not all, of the family inheritance. And it was their responsibility to continue the family line. But yet, the firstborn son also represented all the sinful guilt of the family. And so again, this can sound very strange to us today, living in this more collective sense. So for example, in my family, I'm the firstborn son. Now, if my dad, my father would do something, you know, break the law, as a family, we would be embarrassed by that. There would be shame with that. But I would not feel a responsibility uh, to continue uh, to kind of free him from this debt, maybe to go to jail for him. But again, this is not how ancient cultures thought. 
And so what is taking place with this 10th plague is because of the position of the firstborn as representing the family, the firstborn son is bearing the guilt and sins of the family. But what is interesting about this 10th plague is that it did not just apply to the Egyptians. It applied to both the Egyptians and the Israelites. See, all the other plagues, one through nine, it was only with the Egyptians. The Israelites had been spared. And so if there was darkness over the land, there was light where the Israelites lived, but not this 10th plague. And the reason for that is because everyone is guilty before a holy and righteous God. This plague was a plague of divine justice because everyone is guilty of their sin. But to be delivered from this judgment, God in his mercy, he told his people to take a lamb, a lamb without defect, a lamb without blemish. And they were to take this lamb and to sacrifice it and spread blood over their doorposts. And as this angel of destruction went through the land, that angel looked at the homes that had the blood spread over the doorpost, and that angel passed over the home. And on that night, the Lord instructed his people to not only put the blood on the doorpost, but to be dressed and ready to eat a quick meal because they were going to be living, leaving Egypt. And after that 10th plague took place, Pharaoh, he said he had enough, and he told the people to leave. And while the meal at the time of the actual Passover was eaten very quickly, over time this Passover celebration became much more formal. It was a much longer meal. And there were different elements added to it. And all these different elements are, are very symbolic. And so in this Passover meal, there were four cups of wine. And each of these cups represented different things, such as God's rescue from Egypt freedom from slavery, God's redemptive power, and a renewed relationship with God. There were bitter herbs to symbolize the, the bitterness and the, the harshness of the condition that the Israelites had been in in their slavery. There was a lamb that was to be totally eaten by the family. And then there was unleavened bread. And unleavened bread throughout the Bible represents sin but the reason that this bread was unleavened is they were to leave Egypt quickly. There was not time for it to rise. But we also need to realize that this Passover that took place was pointing to the ultimate Passover found in Jesus Christ. Because there was another son, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who was called by John the Baptist when he began his public ministry, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And when John said that, it would have pointed the people back to this Passover. And so Jesus, he, he takes that. He takes this Passover that they had celebrated for almost 1,500 years, and now he makes it into something new about himself. Look at verse 14. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. Verse 17, after taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Verse 20, in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Now, this Passover meal was a, a long meal, and the leader of the family would walk through the different kind of phases of the meal, retelling the story of the deliverance from Egypt. And Jesus, he's the leader of his disciples, so he takes on this responsibility. But here's what is so remarkable about this passage. This Passover meal that the, the people of Israel had celebrated for around 1,500 years, it was a, a national celebration. Every Jewish family was to participate. But Jesus takes this meal and he remakes it into something new. And he makes this meal not about the Passover, not what took place in the book of Exodus, but Jesus makes it about himself. And during the meal, the, the four cups of wine were served. And between the second and third is when the lamb would come out, 
when the unleavened bread would come out and would have been eaten. And as the disciples are enjoying the meal, Jesus takes the bread, this bread known as the bread of affliction, and he gives thanks for it, and then he breaks it apart into smaller pieces and gives it to his disciples. And they would have expected him to talk about the Passover event, the affliction that the Israelites had faced in their slavery at the hands of the Egyptians. But he doesn't do that. Instead, Jesus says, and try to visualize this, Jesus is holding the bread. His disciples are holding their piece of the bread that Jesus had just broken off and given to them. And instead, he says this, this is my body given for you. And then Jesus took what would have been the third cup of wine, this cup known as the cup of redemption. And he says, this cup is my blood poured out for you. And the bread and the cup, what they represent is Jesus' substitutionary sacrifice for us. And Jesus did give up his body. Jesus was arrested and during his his trial, he was beaten and he was flogged. If you're not familiar with what what flogging is, it was this whip that had pieces of bone and metal, and it would hit your back and just rip your flesh. A crown of thorns was was created, and it was placed on his head. About three inches deep into his head, it would have gone. And then Jesus went to the cross, and he was nailed there for us. And he was on that cross for six hours. But as bad as the physical suffering was, It was the spiritual suffering for our sin, which was the worst. See, all of our sin throughout humankind, throughout history, was placed on Christ. And he was disgusting for us. It says in Isaiah 52, verse 14, speaking of Jesus giving his body through the beating, through the flogging, through the cross, It says that his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being. And his form was so marred beyond human likeness. And Christ did that for us because of his amazing grace. And he took the wrath of God for our sin. Now we can be uncomfortable with that, talking about God's wrath. I thought God is a God of love, and he is. That's why he sent Christ. But God is also holy. He's also just. And so what we see at the cross is is God's love and justice. And our sin was poured out on Christ, and, and he took that wrath for us. And he did that so that we would be spiritually set free. See, in the Passover, the people were in slavery. But what we enjoy today is that we are freed from our slavery to sin. Do we still struggle with sin? Yes. But we are not slaves to it. The people of Israel, they they were in bondage and in the control of Pharaoh. But we have been freed from the control of Satan. We have been freed from our rebellion against God. And we have been delivered from death. And so, yes, Christ may come, but if he doesn't, by the time that we die, we can take hope that when we die physically, we are immediately ushered into the presence of our Savior. And, and, And when we're in the presence of our Savior, we await when Christ does come back. When we receive our new and glorified bodies, no longer will we have to deal with sin. And there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. And so as we prepare to receive this Lord's Supper, how should we take this meal today? Well, first, let me clarify. You do not have to be a member of our church to receive the Lord's Supper, but you do need to be a member of Christ's body. You need to be a believer. But let me walk through some things as we we prepare to receive the Lord's Supper. How should we take this meal? First, look to the past to be reminded of Christ's goodness. The Passover meal at the time of Jesus looked back over a thousand years to the events of Exodus. Today, as we receive the Lord's Supper, we look back over 2,000 years ago to the cross. And if you are struggling with doubt, given your circumstances in life, maybe maybe you're doubting God's goodness for you, look to the cross. If he would not spare his own son, he will walk with you and be with you in any circumstance. Look to the present and be encouraged by Christ's presence with you today. 
As believers, we have the spirit of Christ that lives in us. Be encouraged by that. Jesus is with you right now. And if you are struggling with sin, I would say take this opportunity to confess it to him. Take this present moment and renew your relationship with the Lord. You may be struggling in your relationship the last few weeks, the last maybe few months or even years. Take this moment to renew your relationship with your Savior. And lastly, look to the future to have confidence in Christ's return. Our life as a Christian, we are not promised that things will be easier. In fact, it may be harder. And the world seems so crazy. Again, this week, we are reminded of the evilness that is in this world, the brokenness. But though we may not understand all the ways of the Lord, we can still have confidence that he is in control, that he reigns. And so we endure in this life through the power and presence of Christ. We endure and continue to strive in our Christian walk because we have hope that he will return. We take hope that we will have new bodies one day, bodies without sin, a new heaven, a new earth. There'll be no more pain, no more sorrow, no more tears. We endure because of our hope in Jesus Christ that he reigns today and he will return.